continues later killing eve Tonight, urgent intervention. The government steps in after a 14th resident dies at the Newmarch Aged Care Home. Good evening, I'm Juanita Phillips. This is ABC News Sunday. The back to school stoush continues. The education minister at loggerheads with a premier. Millions were raised during the summer bushfires, but how much of that money has found its way to those in need? And the Warriors fly in from New Zealand as the NRL gets ready to resume play. The state and federal governments have both intervened in New March House as coronavirus continues to spread through the aged care home. There's been another fatality there, bringing the death toll to 14. And two more workers at the Western Sydney facility have tested positive. Staff have been ordered to take daily tests for COVID-19 and a team of infection control specialists is being sent in. State political reporter Ashley Raper. A crisis within a crisis inside Newmarch House. Outside, the fear grows by the day. With this facility, um, they don't seem to have any control over the spread and um, highly vulnerable population. 14 residents have now lost their lives. The latest, Anne Fay, who died in Nepean Hospital yesterday. She was 76. Her family says she was happy and healthy until she tested positive last week. There's no words, nothing that anybody can say that will satisfy you. Uh, it's, it's just nothing. Two more staff at Newmarch have tested positive, taking the total number of cases there to 63. Now each worker will have to take a coronavirus test every day to try to contain the outbreak. It seems to me that uh, in talking to the infectious diseases specialists that that's, that's a really good step that we could take. On top of daily testing for workers, there will also be more infection control specialists brought in to help staff with personal protective equipment. And Anglicare says residents who've tested negative are being moved into a separate wing to those infected. They may eventually be removed from the home altogether. For those of, the, of us that have got negative parents or, or family in there, we just want them out. We don't trust that they're going to be looked after appropriately. The state's opposition wants the New South Wales Health Minister to act and speed up the process. The Minister has to take control. He has to show leadership. He has to be able to step in. He has enormous powers to do so. And I am urging him today to use those powers under the Public Health Act. The new cases at the aged care home were two of the four new cases of coronavirus reported in New South Wales from more than 7,000 tests. So while the situation at Newmarch House worsens, the outlook for the state is more positive. Ashley Raper, ABC News, Sydney. The Federal Education Minister has been forced into an embarrassing backdown after attacking the Victorian Premier's approach to schools. Dan Tian accused Dan Andrews of a failure of leadership, only to withdraw the comments hours later. As political editor Andrew Proben explains, the decision to send children back to school remains hotly contested. School's back for some. Have a good day. South Australia, Western Australia and the Northern Territory belled the resumption of classroom teaching last week. Other states and territories are to follow, but not Victoria. This is a failure of leadership by Dan Andrews. The Federal Education That's Minister fine. taking the cane to the Victorian Premier. Why are you taking a sledgehammer to your school system? We don't need the Federal Education Minister trying to bully and harass state education ministers. At issue is why Victoria is resisting the medical advice to the National Cabinet that schools present a low risk to students and can be fully open. We have one Premier in particular who is jeopardising the national consensus on this. And the Premiers should listen to the medical experts. For a political hit, his timing was poor. Victorian authorities revealing a primary school would be undergoing a deep clean after a teacher overseeing vulnerable students was diagnosed with COVID-19. I'm sure that Dan Tien would have liked to have had that knowledge before making those remarks earlier today. Dan Tian's unusually fiery criticism of the Victorian Premier risks shattering the bipartisanship that served Australia well during this crisis. 
National Cabinet's unity has been its strength and allowed the Prime Minister to forge a world-leading response. But with that spirit threatened, the Federal Education Minister sought to clear up any suggestion he'd been acting on Scott Morrison's orders. Dan Tian issuing a statement saying personal frustration had led him to overstep the mark in questioning Premier Andrew's leadership. I withdraw, he said. Our advice has not changed. Despite the minister's backtracking, it's understood the Prime Minister does not resile from his firm view that students should return to the classroom. And on that, he has some expert backing. Children should go back to school. We've got very low transmission in Australia, and it's probably as low as we're going to get. And we're going to have to live with this for the next 18 months to two years before an effective vaccine becomes available. We will take it from here. A long time for students, teachers and parents to get used to the new normal. Andrew Proben, ABC News, Canberra. The NRL says it's on track to resume competition later this month. The New Zealand Warriors arrived at Tamworth Airport this evening after being granted an exemption by Border Force to travel. They'll be in isolation there for the next fortnight. The country music capital became the centre of the rugby league world when the New Zealand Warriors touched down in Tamworth. Star winger David Fusatua didn't travel for compassionate reasons, while hooker Nathaniel Roach wasn't feeling well and was told to stay home. He didn't and hasn't had any di uh, direct um, contact with any player or staff member that's flying to Australia now. The ARL Commission chairman says the Warriors' arrival shows the bold bid to restart the competition is on track. The fact that we've got both the federal and state government approvals for the, for the Warriors, I'm very confident that we'll be able to start on the 28th of May. The Warriors will be in Tamworth under strict isolation conditions for a fortnight before relocating to the central coast. While they were granted an exemption, there was no such success for the Melbourne Storm, who had asked to train at their home base. They're now hoping to set up camp across the border in New South Wales. They sought an exemption. That exemption uh, was not granted. Uh, you know, no one is going to be getting special treatment. Peter Volandis says COVID-19 won't be a problem for the players. But it's one in 10,000 chance um, to catch the virus if they abide by our biosecurity measures. The risk to the community is zero. Social distancing breaches from players during the week could be a blessing in disguise, according to former NRL coach Matthew Elliott. Now we've seen some poor decisions leading into this. Hopefully everyone is now super aware of what the expectations are from the, the leadership of the game, but also the entire community. Each NRL club will have a briefing tomorrow when players will be told what their obligations will be under the biosecurity measures. Training resumes on Tuesday ahead of the scheduled competition restart later this month. Duncan Huntstyle, ABC News. Property inspections and on-site auctions will be allowed in New South Wales from next weekend. The real estate industry has largely moved online since strict COVID-19 restrictions were announced six weeks ago. They're being lifted, the government says, as another sign of the state's success in limiting the spread of the virus. Look, there's no doubt this is great news for buyers and sellers. It's just made transacting a whole lot easier again and I'd expect to see an immediate injection of confidence in the market after this announcement. Real estate agents will be told to limit the number of people attending open houses and auctions and physical distancing will be enforced. Brazil has emerged as Latin America's COVID-19 epicentre with the ninth highest death toll in the world overtaking both China and Iran. There have been so many deaths so quickly that parts of the country have run out of coffins. While much of the world is now starting to see a flattening of the curve, in Brazil it's the opposite. The number of cases is rising sharply with 6,000 new cases in just one day this week. Despite all that, the Brazilian president is still telling the country the impact of the virus is exaggerated and social distancing isn't really necessary. At this cemetery in Sao Paulo, burials are happening on an industrial scale. Mourners are allowed five minutes at the gravesite before the next funeral rolls in. From the air, a sobering sight of what may be to come. 13,000 fresh graves have been prepared and they're still digging. 
Across Brazil, cases of infection are rising fast. Hospitals are undermanned and overstretched. Many suspected COVID-19 deaths are not added to the official tally. They wrote here undetermined cause of death. But why don't they carry out an autopsy to verify it? Why hide this stuff? Brazil's poorest citizens live in tightly packed favelas. For many, stopping work means going hungry. How do you self-isolate when you have seven people across three generations living to a single room, uh, no proper water sanitation, no proper running water? Rio de Janeiro-based journalist Lucinda Elliott says the city's infamous crime gangs have stepped up to encourage stay-at-home directives. You had gangs going around in cars with their speakers on, encouraging people to stay at home. Brazil's president has described COVID-19 as a little flu. He's joined protests against lockdown measures imposed by state governors and brushed off the mounting death toll. So what? I mourn the deaths. What do you want me to do? As protests against his handling of the crisis grow, the president has fired his health minister and sacked his federal police chief, prompting his justice minister to resign. But his voter base remains solid. There are clear parallels between the way the US president and his Brazilian counterpart have played this crisis. But even Donald Trump, who presides over the world's highest official death toll, is now pointing to Brazil as a nation having a very hard time. David Lipson, ABC News, Washington. People in Spain have been allowed outside to exercise for the first time in seven weeks after one of the strictest lockdowns in Europe. They've been allocated time slots to take short walks and play sports. Special shifts have been set aside for the elderly and vulnerable people, while the beaches are attracting big crowds of swimmers and surfers. I think people is happy. I'm happy. We are tired. We're tired. We are not in shape, especially older people. But it was a nice day. Social distancing laws are being enforced and masks have been made compulsory on public transport. Still to come tonight, Jeremy Fernandez will be here to look at who's getting it right with the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions. We'll look at what other countries and regions are doing and what we might learn from their experience. I'll be back with the virus straight after the weather. Like many industries, the arts have been hit hard by COVID-19 restrictions. But audiences are showing their support, with many people declining a refund for their cancelled shows. That kind gesture may just help smaller companies stay afloat. Jean Kennedy reports. Wear glasses that make you look like the local psychopath. Crunch time was meant to be David Williamson's swan song, his last work before retirement. I hope they've got you on good chemotherapy. Australia's foremost playwright had three sold-out plays across the nation when coronavirus hit. It was going to be a bit my big finale, like the fireworks. That everything's kept in reserve for the last big bang at the end, and my big bang was halfway through and boom, all, it all went. Generosity, though, from audiences who've refused to accept a refund. I'd like to thank those theatre goers enormously for understanding how precarious live theatre is and what a ter tremendous strain it's going under at the moment. So it's managing to pay the bills and with those donations it, it means we can start ticking off things that we need to do in order to stay here to open our doors again as soon as we can. Many smaller theatre companies like the Ensemble say they rely heavily on box office sales to survive, with up to 90% of their income from tickets. The Bangara Dance Theatre had strong sales to its new show, Sansong. More than a third of ticket holders gave up their refund when shows were cancelled. The nation's largest performing arts company, Opera Australia, says the impact of the COVID shutdown has been devastating. Clearly, one of the last things that will be possible as we emerge from the crisis will be for theatres to be able to full, be full again in the way that they were before this all started. It cancelled three months of shows, but after an appeal for help, found its audience members too were willing to forego the cost of their ticket. But will it be enough to save a struggling industry? It could be quite a while before we have that um, 
experience of live theatre again. There's unwavering support for another band of performers. GWS Giants fans are refusing to desert their club. Of its 27,000 members, just 12 have asked for their money back. We're finding that our commercial partners and our membership base have shown a great deal of um, support for us and a lot of loyalty. On that stage, at least, the show might soon go on. Jean Kennedy, ABC News. Well, Australians dug deep earlier this year, raising hundreds of millions of dollars for the victims of the bushfires. But amid this outpouring of generosity, one of the nation's largest charities says it's had to sift through hundreds of fraudulent applications for help. From Mingello in the Southern Highlands, the ABC's bushfire recovery reporter, Philippa MacDonald, takes a look at how much money has actually been given to those in need. Before this, it was the dream block, but the bushfires on the 4th of January in Wingello destroyed everything here except a small greenhouse and a patch of garden. I don't really spend a lot of time feeling sad about the situation. I have a more of a focus on what we can do to improve the situation. Almost four months on, Michael Kirchhoff and his wife Casey have received a helping hand from four charities, totalling almost $50,000. So a total of $40,000 from the Red Cross, which which is, which is really nice, it's uh, very helpful. After the fires, children donated pocket money. Everyone gave what they could. So we've raised uh, $200 million, that's incredibly generous. Since January, the Red Cross has distributed grants totalling $78.6 million to 4,000 people. During the emergency, the Red Cross estimated it provided support to more than 27,000 people. Its administration fee is capped at under 4%. But there's been a hitch. Of 5,500 applications for grants, a quarter could not be verified. Sadly, we've had hundreds of fraudulent applications that we need to work through to make sure we're not, because of speed, getting funds to the wrong people. Throughout the bushfires, the Salvation Army served a quarter of a million meals. In its bushfire appeal, it raised $41 million. So far, it's spent $19 million, most of that in New South Wales, helping more than 11,000 Australians. It charges a governance fee of 2%. We need to be there for the long haul because there are people who may not have even put up their hand yet who will approach us and we're still receiving uh, requests. The major charities the ABC spoke to said they're planning for a three-year recovery period. We are definitely moving to the point now where people are looking to rebuild and so those sorts of needs of people moving uh, into permanent accommodation, rebuilding on their own land. But three months on, there remains a big question mark over the fate of more than $50 million raised by Celeste Barber on social media. This is so good that we have all come together. The money went to a registered rural fire brigade trust fund. The total fund, the trust fund, uh, was, was well over $100 million. Um, I think Celeste's fund from memory was about $52 million. Celeste Barber's agent did not respond to the ABC's request for an interview, but the RFS insists the trust fund has very specific conditions. The money is donated and locked into the trust fund for the brigade. Uh, movement. It's, it's not an RFS fund. The fight over the funds will go to the Supreme Court this week. Back in Wingello, there's a lot to look forward to. We're expecting our first child as well, which is great. Uh, so it's, it's sort of a bit of a wild 2020 for us. Uh, so that's going to be exciting. One unexpected consequence of the COVID-19 crisis has been the dramatic drop in the price of oil. A trade dispute between Russia and Saudi Arabia, combined with the sharp drop in demand, has seen prices at the pump drop to levels not seen since the early 2000s. Across New South Wales, the average price of regular unleaded this week was just 91 cents a litre. The lowest price was at Campbelltown in southwest Sydney, 73 cents. To explain what's driven prices so low and to look at whether they'll stay there, here's Alan Kohler. Well, it's been a while since we've seen these sort of numbers at the Bowser. So how did this happen? And more importantly, how long is it going to last? Remember peak oil? 
Well, maybe not, but it was the theory first proposed by a bloke named M. King Hubbard. In 1956, that oil production would peak in about the year 2000 and then inexorably decline, like this. And when the oil price went above 140 US dollars a barrel in June 2008, it seemed like Mr. Hubbard was an oracle and that the price, as predicted, was on the up and the world was in trouble. But then came the GFC and the price fell 80% before gradually, painfully recovering as the producers led by Saudi Arabia throttled production and got back some control. Next problem, American fracking. Thanks to the technology that extracts oil from shale deep underground, the United States went from big importer to self-sufficient and then exporter. Down went the price again. Fast forward to April the 20th, 2020, this year. And that will forever go down as the day the oil price went negative for the first time in history. Minus $37 US a barrel, to be precise. That is, sellers were paying buyers to take it off their hands. A negative oil price? How could that happen? Well, for a start, the peak oil thing turned out to be wrong. Thanks largely to fracking, there's been a glut, not a shortage. And then the demand destruction from the coronavirus shutdowns has been much greater than what happened in the GFC. For example, US gasoline demand has halved from 10 million barrels a day to five. And as a result of that, storage tanks are full to the point where oil is having to be stored in dozens of tankers off the Californian coast. Saudi Arabia and the OPEC producers are desperately cutting production and the American producers are shutting rigs and, burdened by massive debts, are starting to file for bankruptcy. This graph shows just how bad it's getting. The number of rigs operating in the US has collapsed. So it's really bad for oil producers, but at least the planet's enjoying it. Air pollution and carbon emissions are also declining because, of course, there are fewer cars and trucks on the road and planes in the sky. So we might as well roll down the window and enjoy the fresh air while we can. Now to tonight's special report. And while some of the country has had good rain this week, other parts are still in the grip of drought. The Bureau of Meteorology is predicting a wetter than average winter for much of the country, but that distribution is not even. Here's a look at how dry Australia was in December last year. And here's that same map from March. The green areas show above average soil moisture. And you can see big parts of Queensland and South Australia are still missing out. Even for those receiving rain, years of hard times mean farmers are carrying huge debts. As always, charities are helping out. But now with the pandemic, donations are down and fewer volunteers are available. National Rural and Regional Correspondent Dominic Schwartz travelled to St George in southwestern Queensland. Green is finally back on the palette of this cattle and sheep property west of St George. But after seven years of drought, there are not many animals left to enjoy it. It's been really hard, I can tell you. But uh, you don't talk about those sort of things. We've just had to battle on and survive the best way we can. For John Beardmore, flooding rain in February brought promise, but there hasn't been meaningful rain since. It doesn't rain cash crops and cows, so yeah, we still need to support our farmers because they're still, they're still struggling. Tash Johnston is the founder of Drought Angels. Normally we have quite a lot of volunteers, but obviously due to COVID-19 and they're all mainly 70 plus, we've had to send them home so we can keep them safe. The Chinchilla-based charity last year raised $11 million to help farmers across Australia, but donations have dived during the pandemic. About 50% at least. With fewer volunteers, Tash and her husband, Steele, are now making the deliveries. Today, they're headed to St George, 300 kilometres away. Recent rain has turned dust bowls into pasture, but it's going to take a lot more to turn farmers' fortunes around. People still have huge debts to actually um, to deal with, and if it doesn't get follow-up rain, they won't have any money coming into their bank accounts. First stop for the Drought Angels is a local charity. So what do you believe is your value in each box? Uh, about 100. Then they're off for a home visit. Welcome to Rose Hill. John and Elaine Beardmore expected their guests, but not the bounty. Groceries, toiletries and fresh fruit and vegetables. Everything. 
I had a lot of things given to us over the droughts and that, but nothing like this. So we've got some prepaid visas for you too. For people who pride themselves on feeding others, it's overwhelming. It's unreal. Thank you for that. Chinchilla farmers Greg and Leanne Evans know the feeling. They dared to hope the drought was breaking after solid rain in February, but with nothing since, their mung beans have languished. I don't know that we'll be able to feed Australia with, with what we've got here, that's for sure. Just to be able to know that drought angels um, can put some food on the table or it can get your kids some clothes, you know, clothes for school, has been very uplifting. If anything, coronavirus has definitely uh, let people know that how much we need our Australian farmers and what beautiful produce we produce, so it's incredibly important to support them now. Marmalade. In the event of a major coronavirus outbreak in the bush, the Royal Flying Doctor Service will play a vital role getting patients to hospitals for treatment. The service has already dealt with hundreds of confirmed or suspected cases. Now it's busy hiring pilots laid off by the major airlines. A month ago, Joe Sayed was living his childhood dream, flying 737s for Tiger Air, until travel restrictions cost him his job. That kind of came as a shock and you had to reread it a few times. But a week later, he was on a plane to Perth for a full-time gig with the Royal Flying Doctor Service. Weeks I was a self-isolation because of the closure of the quarters. Um, so that was, um, I, it was actually pretty intense. He's one of many commercial pilots now back in work, thanks to the service increasing its frontline capacity in response to the pandemic. The Royal Flying Doctor Service is uh, calling in as many staff as we can find. People are coming back from holidays. Uh, we're building up our casual rosters. Uh, we're uh, in some cases having staff return to us from other organisations. Since February, the RFDS has transported almost 300 patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 with extra precautions in place. It's really important to us that we protect our operational staff from any illness whatsoever. So our base is locked down to visitors unless there's a very good reason for entering. And our non-operational staff are actually all working from home. While it normally runs on donations, the service is currently relying on the federal government, which last week provided an extra $11 million to help with coronavirus costs. They've also established a process to ensure that we can deliver emergency evacuations as and when they're needed, to ensure that we can take mobile respiratory clinics into communities who may need uh, early testing. Having first worked for the RFDS five years ago, Mr Sayed says he's grateful to be back. Helping the community, knowing that you're out there um, doing good for the um, Western Australian community. Making sure rural and remote Australians can get the care they need. Mahalia Carter, ABC News. Checking the weather forecast now and after two very windy, wintry days, those cold southwesterlies have eased off considerably. Sydney was dry, cool and sunny today. Highs ranged from 17 to 20 degrees. Further west, Katoomba only got to 13. Overnight minimums were cooler than average for much of the state, with single figures just about everywhere west of the ranges. A mostly sunny day for New South Wales, with some isolated morning showers along the western slopes and ranges. Fresh southwesterly winds kept most parts cooler than average during the day. 22 was the warmest it got, and that was at Casino. In the capitals, it was cold in Melbourne, Hobart and Canberra, warm in Brisbane and Perth. The skies over New South Wales are mostly clear due to high pressure and a dry air mass. Those strong winds are easing as a low over the Tasman moves further east. Hazardous surf conditions in its wake will last until Tuesday when a high pressure system moves in. Continuing cold in the southern capitals tomorrow, Canberra getting down to zero overnight. Around New South Wales tomorrow, it'll be dry and sunny, apart from the chance of a shower in the northeast and the Hunter. The Bureau has issued a hazardous surf warning for the entire New South Wales coast. A cool morning with frost and fog about the ranges, western slopes and southern inland. Daytime temperatures below average. Southerly winds fresh at times near the coast. A strong wind warning has been issued for the Eden coast. Windy again in the Alps and further inland sunny and cold. Large, powerful surf conditions around Sydney with fresh southwesterly winds. In Sydney tomorrow, a top of 20 degrees, sunny and dry after a very cool night. Getting down to 3 or 4 degrees in the west, 11 in the city. The sun will rise at 6.31 and over the next seven days it's going to stay generally dry and sunny with just the chance of a light shower. 
It'll be cool for the first part of the week, then it'll start warming up again into the mid to high 20s by next weekend. That's ABC News Sunday. Stay with us now for Jeremy Fernandez. Coming up, the waiting game. With Australia now on a timetable to end the tough restrictions, what can we learn from other countries? Plus, the cracks appearing in bilateral relationships. How will COVID-19 shape the new world order? You're watching The Virus. Hello, I'm Jeremy Fernandez. Australians have five more days to persuade the government to ease social restrictions and to begin the process of reviving the economy. The Prime Minister says there are 15 criteria that must be met and that the nation's already achieved 11 of those. Some states have already moved, the Northern Territory has opened pools and playgrounds and is allowing weddings and funerals to go ahead with no limitations. In Western Australia, groups of 10 people are now allowed to gather indoors as well as outside. If National Cabinet is satisfied that progress is continuing, Scott Morrison will announce on Friday which parts of the shutdown will be lifted. Of those that remain outstanding, there is one that Australians can do something about, and that is downloading the COVID Safe app. This is a critical issue for National Cabinet when it comes to making decisions next Friday about how restrictions can be eased. And here's why relief is on the horizon. It's because the national daily case rate remains relatively low. We're keeping below 20 new infections a day, which authorities say is manageable. The national death toll is now 95, and about 80 people are being treated in hospital for COVID-19. Well, it's not just Australia. Across the world, countries and cities are starting to work their way out of these lockdowns. Some slowly and some much faster than others. Philip Williams takes a look at a couple of countries that are in a very similar position to Australia right now and a couple of other countries that are just not. What do Iceland, South Korea and Australia have in common? The answer is in all of these countries, new cases of coronavirus are down to around single digits each day. So what can we learn about how they've handled the pandemic? Let's start with South Korea. It never had a full lockdown. This week, churches reopened and their soccer league kicks off again on Friday. I, I go to the office every day, I go for a beer at night. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much a normal life. The strategy was to start early with testing and to contact trace using data from organisations including the police, credit card and phone companies. There is no app. If you own a phone in South Korea, you'll be tracked. People do um, accept uh, that slight intrusion needs their life yeah, as a, as a trade-off. That level of access wasn't ever on the table here, but the question is whether that's the degree of intrusion you need to be effective. On the other side of the world, another island nation has made huge strides using an app more like ours. The Icelandic version is also voluntary, but it's been downloaded by a greater percentage of the people. From tomorrow, all of Iceland's schools and universities will reopen, along with massage parlours, museums and dentists. Public gatherings of up to 50 people will be allowed. That's been possible only because of extensive testing, including people with no symptoms, which is what Australia is also planning. First and foremost, I think that it has shown us that with a focused effort, with the use of modern science, even an epidemic like this can be contained. We'll also be watching other countries that are opening up more quickly to see if they've moved too fast. In the US state of Texas, they've just reopened all gyms, cinemas, shopping malls and restaurants this weekend. I was eager. I saw where we were supposed to open up today and so I because it's gone stir crazy at home. I woke up and said, it's time to go. I've been waiting for this day. And one of the hardest hit countries, Italy, is restarting major industries from tomorrow. Museums, libraries and retailers reopen in a fortnight. Perhaps even more significant, 
diners will be able to return to the city's trattorias from the 1st of June. In settings um, where easing is happening stepwise, you know, that can help to give us hopefully some information about which types of measures um, are most likely to be safe. Here in Australia, the biggest worry is complacency. I fear that we see these other nations opening up and think, why can't we do that? The virus hasn't changed and we're susceptible. And in Australia, we're also mindful that we're going into the winter season when most respiratory viruses are more transmissible. We don't understand a lot about this virus and seasonality, but it does make us extra vigilant and, and aware of the likelihood of those outbreaks occurring. Every country in the world is, you know, trying to learn from one another and what worked and what did not work. It will take two weeks to know whether Texas and Italy have been too bold. It's a delicate balance no one wants to get wrong. Well, global tensions over the outbreak increased this week. The US is threatening more trade tariffs against China if it's found to have misled the world. Beijing is continuing to lash out against calls for an independent international inquiry. It's accusing Western countries of trying to shift the blame for how they are handling the crisis. Chinese state media are running concerted campaigns to try to discredit foreign governments. The Chinese ambassador to Australia even threatened an economic backlash if the government here continued to push for an inquiry. The Prime Minister, though, is standing firm. I don't think this is a remarkable suggestion. I think it's a fairly obvious and common sense suggestion. With respect to Australia, who had the temerity to ask for an investigation. Who in the world wouldn't want an investigation of how this happened? So those tensions have many wondering what the global power balance will be in the post-coronavirus world. I put some of your questions to Stephen Loosley, a senior fellow at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, and Professor Stan Grant from Charles Sturt University. How seriously should we take China's displeasure at the way Australia is calling for an international investigation into the origins of this coronavirus? It's been a really huge week in terms of that bilateral relationship, hasn't it? It should be taken seriously, but it ought not to determine our policy, uh, Jeremy. A sovereign country determines its uh, own policy, often in concert with allies and partners and in regional groupings. Now, the fact that Australia has called for an inquiry to determine precisely what happened with the spread and is happening with the spread of the coronavirus is not an outrageous proposition. If we look back to 19, 1920, it would have been absurd if people had suggested there ought not to be a tracing of Spanish uh, uh, flu. The big difference is China 2020 is not Spain 1920. Um, it is an entirely different proposition to enter into this potentially combative space with a country that is your biggest trading partner. It's not just a question of what Australia does here, but it's how China reacts. We've seen immediately China bristle at this. We've seen the veiled threats about impact on our trade. Their economy has taken an enormous hit because of the impact of coronavirus. Going into the coronavirus uh, scare, its economy was already at its weakest point in 30 years. But at the same time, the West is now hit economically. Uh, it's weakened us as well. It's a perfect storm. It's an authoritarian challenge at a time when democracy was in retreat around the world, when there was declining freedom around the world, where there was a rise of nationalism and a, and a vulnerability and unpredictability to the geopolitical landscape. A lot of questions have been raised about the WHO's slow response in labelling this a pandemic and its favourable treatment of China. Where does that leave us in terms of other global bodies that can effectively police and manage not just the outbreak on the ground, but the relationships that it puts under strain as a result? It's a good question, uh, uh, Jeremy. And frankly, the WHO is irreplaceable at a global level. You have other bodies doing some very valuable things, but they're mostly to be found in the, uh, in the philanthropic not-for-profit uh, not sector, Médecins Sans Frontières, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the George Institute and so on, all doing really outstanding things in the health area, but you really need the WHO as a coordinating body. 
Stephen Loosley and Stan Grant there. There's a lot more from that Q&A session. You can check out the full 40-minute conversation on the ABC News YouTube and Facebook channels. Keep the questions coming in. We'll hold another live stream next Friday at 3.20pm Eastern Time. Make sure you join us then. For now, stay safe. Goodbye. Next on ABC and iView, a couple dream of building a house heated solely by the sun. Can they make it work? Grand Designs New Zealand, then Mystery Road. is hitting the road. Australia, here I come. In search of what makes us Aussies tick. The dream is probably freedom. Here How I you going, How did this all happen? Divorce. Wonderful thing. 10,000 Ks. This is first day in kindergarten. Well, this is all a bit friendly. Yeah. <laughs> From our big cities. Breathe to little towns with big stories. We had nothing left in the tank. What you're facing, it's so tough. I had no idea. I'm an Aussie. I play AFL. Move it! That's an Australian dream in action. I'm Liam Margulies. Almost Australian. Starts Tuesday, May 19, ABC and iView. It's because I love you And because you're near my heart Growing, learning, exploring. Do what you wanna do, be what you wanna be, yeah. You're with them every step of the way. Ooh. And we're with you too. Do what you wanna do, be what you wanna be, yeah. The number one place for Aussie kids to be. ABC Kids. It's because I love you. When the world feels all topsy-turvy. Felt like the 70s there for a second. Wednesday nights on ABC are solid as a rock. I mean, like everyone, I'm just getting so much done. Fresh new episodes. Don't laugh, but you used by dates about finished by now. All freshly sanitised. Hard quiz gets very similar reviews. We better go for a walk and flatten the curve. That's Wednesday from 8 on ABC and iView. Serious people, mate. You need backup. Blood. Need to get forensics down here. Anyone you suspect? Everyone's a suspect, aren't they? Mystery Road continues tonight, 8.30, ABC and iView. Windy Wellington is renowned for its challenging weather and steep topography, so you wouldn't think anyone would be daft enough to build a house on a cliff edge and rely solely on the sun to heat it but one daring young couple are doing just that. Wellington is my hometown. It's an exciting mix of dramatic landscape and human endeavour, with high windy hills that have challenged generations of architects and home buyers. After six years working overseas, Carl and Amelie came home to Wellington with a good sized house deposit and their baby Claudie in a backpack. Carl works in sustainable building and Amelie in energy efficiency. They had their hearts set on a classic inner suburbs.